All right, episode 354 of Global from Asia, hot topic, all these Amazon acquisitions and aggregators. Ready for this, Jan? Yes, ready for this, Mike. (laughs) All right. Welcome to the Global from Asia podcast, where the daunting process of running an international business is broken down into straight up actionable advice. And now your host, Michael Michelini. Podcast 354, we are talking about the third panel of the CBM, our first ever online CBM, the buy, sell, scale, and consolidation in the e-commerce and FBA world. What are the big Amazon sellers are doing? And in today's market, want consolidation and roll-ups. We're going to hear about experts discussing about the hot topics and talking about both sides of the table. So I'm so excited to to re-listen re, to this session again. I I think I forget I forgot some of the the great insights, but it's great to be able to do the podcast and talk about these great things again to you know for a refresher. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. I know we it was it was a third one, Jan. It was late night. I don't know about you. I I'm a I'm a morning person. Uh, at, at night I was dead. I think I was on my I was drinking. I was drinking the my Qingdao beer. <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah, I remember. I don't ever drink either, but uh, I had to loosen up a little. It was it was an intense one, but this was a really uh, fascinating conversation. We had some great experts in the Amazon space uh, and talk about aggregation. We had we had actually some really good people. Do you do you want to remind us who who's on this panel? Yeah. Yeah, we have these people in other panels too, like one and two. Right now we have David Nicolucci, Luciano Drummer, John Cavendish, Andy Lee, and Ken Yoon. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's great. And then we had uh, some good insights, you know, like, should you sell your business now? Like, what are some trends that are happening? What's the future? Why are these, why are all these people buying all these companies and, uh, and businesses? And uh, I think I was popping in a little bit too. And I think after this, uh, the panel recording, I can share with you, Jan, and the others about some things that have been happening with what I'm doing in the Amazon acquisition space. We also made a video, a special announcement at globalfromasia.com slash broker about some of what we've been doing in the Amazon acquisition space here at, at GFA and in the consulting things that I'm doing. So you can check that video out too. But I think... For now, I think let's hop into the into this panel and check it out. What do you think, Jan? Yeah, let's check it out, Mike. Okay, let's do it. Okay, and before we get into the panel, we have one of our amazing GFA partner sponsors. Jan, who we got up next? Yeah, we have Travis Price from Mercury. So he has been a long, uh, year-long sponsorship and a partner of ours. So glad to hear from Travis. I think he's going to be on for about five minutes to ten minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. And he was up super early. <laughs> I think it was 5 or 6 a.m. in the West Coast U.S. So thanks for that, Travis. And he also shares some of his insights of his own e-commerce experience. So it's great. Let's Let's tune in. Everybody pay special attention to Travis. He got up bright and early for us. So Travis, <laughs> Travis is heading e-commerce growth at Mercury Bank. And I'm, he's a, you know, they're a happy supporter of the community at Global From Asia and this event. And we also, I also use them personally for our Amazon business uh, for a U.S. bank that's connected to my Amazon FBA account. It luckily it helped me because I had a non-American partner. So I, I wouldn't have been able to get a normal U.S. bank with uh, outgoing into the U.S. myself. So so thank you for that, Travis and Mercury. Do you want to you know, give a little intro before we get into the panel? Yeah, for sure. So thank you, that, that was a great intro. So my name's Travis. I am leading our e-commerce efforts at Mercury Bank. Mercury is a bank built specifically for startups, online businesses, e-commerce businesses. So we are a 100% online U.S. banking service. And we are, what's unique about us, one big thing that's unique about us is that we're extremely foreign founder friendly. So a lot of the incumbent banks in the States will, will not touch uh, non-US citizens, you know, no social security, no social security numbers. We don't care about any of that. Like as long as you have a great business and you're legitimate and you're, you know, 
you're not on some fraud or money laundering list, but we're happy to bank you. The only caveat being you will need a U.S. entity to bank with with Mercury. So Wyoming, you know, Delaware are popular places to incorporate uh, if you don't have one already. A little background on me, though, is I started in e-commerce in 2015. I invented a product called Santa's Flask, which became a number one bestseller on Amazon. It was, or it is still, I guess it, it's called like the wine stocking. So it's like, imagine in, you know, these, these wine bags, I don't know if you've seen them like in Australia or in the States, you know, I just made one in the shape of a Christmas stocking and patented it and it went like crazy viral. And we ended up, yeah, being the number one bestseller in our category for five years in a row on Amazon, barware category, I sold that business, went on to work for wish.com for two years, uh, managing a growth team, sort of on new initiatives. And we built out what's called the Wish Local Program, which is a local brick and mortar uh, retail program where we partner with, with local stores around the world. And then customers can go into the store to pick up their product. So it was sort of Wish's answer to Amazon FBA. You know, they're like, we don't have all this capital to build these warehouses. Let's just like try to find some space somewhere through partnerships. So that, that program is doing really well. And I'm very proud to have been a part of it. So if you guys ever have any questions about Wish, selling on Wish, I think that's sort of a black hole for a lot of merchants. And so definitely hit me up and I'm happy to help in that regard. That's sort of my spiel. I also sell Amazon FBA. Right now I'm launching a new brand in the e-bike category. I'm just like addicted to, to PPC and Amazon. <laughs> and uh, my goal is to um, scale that to the point where I can sell it to one of these aggregators that, that, you know, all these aggregators are popping up everywhere looking to acquire solid, you know, Amazon brands and businesses. But I think I'm going over time. So I need to go back to Mercury because because <laughs> that's why I'm being that's why I'm being paid to be here by my boss. So, yeah, basically, you know, our, our whole ethos was that U.S. banking for businesses is broken. The traditional incumbents, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, et cetera have been slow to uh, adopt technologies that technology and to understand the needs of today's current, you know, online entrepreneur, online business owner. So we built, we, we built a bank from, from the ground up, our founders in X, like Y Combinator judge or investor. And he's, he's started and sold a few startups. So he, he sort of knew what he was doing, which is good. Anyways, our product offers full, fully fledged FDIC insured. U.S. business bank accounts, checking and savings accounts, virtual debit cards that you can, you know, create up to 30 of them per person, use them for Facebook ad spend, Amazon spend, et cetera. We have very low to zero fees. So typically our only fees are for wire transfers. But if you're a big enough customer with us, even those are, are waived. Everything, like I said, can be done from your phone. We have amazing customer support and just the, the bank feed itself and the account itself is is 10x better than anything you've seen with a bank. And I can say that honestly, because I switched from Wells Fargo for my, my, my e-com business and it's been incredible. So yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Um, feel free to hit me up to Thanks, Travis. Travis at mercury.com and we can give you guys a special deal for being GFA. Yeah, Mike, I don't know if you have anything else to add there. I mean, I think it's pretty clear and we have a lot a lot of amazing content to share, but I think that's, that's already helpful. I mean, I hope people can get it. I, I'm so happy that, you know, when I heard about Mercury, I knew it was a great fit for the community here because we have a lot of, you know, of course in Asia, China, foreigners, cross-border businesses, and a lot of us are always getting our banks shut down. Banks, you know, honestly, I just, I just got a letter from HSBC. I got to fill out more forms and audits and it's horrible. Yeah. So, you know, honestly, I've had a really good experience with Mercury. It's been about, I think I've been using it now for about eight, eight, nine months. Super easy. And there's no application fee. I mean, it doesn't, even if you have a bank account, right? It's like, why not just get a second one? I mean, of course, and I bet you they'll switch to yours anyways, but I mean, there's no, there's no, nothing really to sell. It's like, there's no monthly fee, no application fee. It's all online, yeah. virtual debit cards, you know, like it just seems like a no brainer. So Kathy's question, question is perfect question the Caffrey. No, it's not for US citizens. I mean, you can as US citizens yeah. get it, but we, any we do bank we do bank US citizens, but it we we will bank any 
you know, entrepreneur all over the world. As long as you have a U.S. entity, we we're, we'll bank you. Yeah. So yeah. so we obviously do have U.S. companies with us too, U.S. citizens. Mike, I think the connection was lost. But the one one last thing I just wanted to say that you touched on was like, lost. Am I still here? <laughs> our idea of that around Mercury is to just build the product so good that it, you don't need to talk to anyone. You don't need to do any paperwork. So. We're, we're really trying to think about, you know, what's wrong with banking? How do we fix it? And what other products and services can we build for e-commerce companies specifically? So we'll be coming out with some lending products, credit cards, you know, stuff like that in the future. So, yeah, excited to support okay. everyone here. And uh, Eno is one of your clients. Eno's great. He's in our community too. So he's a happy Mercury customer. And, but yeah, I think, I think that's, a, you know, 10 months now. Great. Thanks, Eno. So I think I really appreciate you waking up early and sharing with us. So I hope some people can reach out to you, Travis at Mercury.com or DM you for here. And I think we'll move forward with the, the panel unless there's any other last things you'd like to add. I'm good. Bye guys. All right. Well, anyway, I think it's time to move to the panel anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. Okay. So, so let's get into the main conversation to now. It's Amazon acquisitions and we have a great lineup here. And just before we start, it's it's one thing. I'm I'm a I'm a new consultant biz dev for Amazon acquisitions firm BBG, Berlin Brand Group, and I would love to talk to you guys also about buying buying businesses. So if you all want to talk to me too, we can do that as well as others on this call. So I just want to make sure I give that announcement. It's my first time to publicly say that. So, but let's hear from the others today. So Ken, Ken, you're in New York City, right? Or New York State? I am. New York City. New York City. New I just City. actually moved from Brooklyn to, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's almost uh, 20 years now at this point. But I guess I'll just kind of go into a quick uh, intro yeah, about please. who I am and, and I guess why I'm here. Yeah, so uh, my name's Ken Wynn. I am, you know, I guess you could say, a, a serial founder. Over 20 years now, this is the cross-section of tech, CPG, and e-commerce. I uh, had a big a company called Virtual Stream in 2016. Uh, folks more on cloud. Um, I'm here because me and my partner, Paul, run a firm called Trinovation Services. And we actually support uh, FBA acquirers, Amazon stores with highly skilled, specialized human capital and back office operations. Uh, so we have teams basically that can support and, and, and scale back office services across the value chain from m &A support, due diligence, customer service, uh, customer satisfaction, logistics, FBA management, essentially. And we kind of sit at the, you know, in between both the sellers and also the acquirers. So we kind of see the traffic and sort of the sentiment across the different kind of players in the marketplace. So that's kind of kind of my perspective here, at least. So hopefully that's, awesome. that helps. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for that. Yeah, we had a great call about a week ago, too. And I, I hope there's more synergies for us and others on the in the community. I see I see Christina here. I don't she was on video and. I don't see if your video is still on. Maybe it's just my connection. Christina, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, hi. If you're here. Hi, guys. Sorry, I encountered some uh, technical problem. Lost sorry. connection. Sorry about that. Maybe we'll move on to David. David, do you want to give an intro? I think she's back. She's back, Mike. She's speaking right now. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> sorry <about laughs> introduce that. yourself, Christina. I will Thank take you. another oh. sip of my beer. This is super <laughs> stressful for me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi guys. I'm Christina, uh, and I have been in helping brands and retailers to go um, internationally. So, on my past experience, I helped the uh, consumer electronic products, the, uh, mostly for the brands, to go to uh, such as uh, Amazon or using their uh, D2C channels to sell their products to overseas. And currently, I'm helping international brands to get into China through the marketplaces such as uh, Timo Global and. Uh, uh, JD.com. Yeah. So I'm quite happy to be here today. Okay. Thank you. I see you now, Thank Christina. you, Christina. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Christina, I've known her for many, many years. She's been yeah. so great in the community yeah. and I'm Thank happy you. to have her today. Thank you, Christina. Okay. Thank you, everyone. David. All right. So yeah, my name is David. I am founder of Growth Hack Consulting. It's a seller that helps, it's an agency that helps Amazon sellers. Yeah, it's kind of late here, you know, after a full day of working, I woke up at eight and it's 8.20 almost here, but here we are. So thanks for having me here. So we help Amazon sellers to pretty much succeed 
on Amazon in any marketplace. I've been a speaker at, you know, cross-border summit and matchmaker in the past year. So I've been knowing Mike for a couple of years right now. We work on some projects together. We're actually working also in the Amazon FBA acquisition industry together. We do consulting. We are helping to, you know, develop business in the China side for probably the number two player right now in this industry. But this industry is is booming right now. So there is a huge amount of money that is invested that is on the table and it's a super hot thing right now. I have personally done some research before for a couple of months. I talked with pretty much the biggest players, but I see new other players popping up every every month, every week because it's super hot right now. So if you're an Amazon seller, you're doing good. You have a small team. You want to scale. You think about you're thinking about selling your business. This is definitely the right time, and you're definitely in the so right now is the time. And uh, I have been in e-commerce for more than ten years. Uh, we agency we have been helping sellers from all across the world, from China, from the U.S., from Europe. Uh, we have generated millions in sales. So yeah, this is pretty much my story, a little summary of what I do, who I am. So very glad to be here and to answer your questions and talk about anything that I can contribute with. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. John, we'd love to hear from you again for those that maybe missed you in the last panel, which was awesome. You did some great insights. Do you want to just give a quick intro again? Sure. Yeah. I'm John Cavendish from Seller Candy. We help Amazon sellers to take care of their sell Amazon Seller Central busy work. So basically any argument that you've been having with Seller Central, we will take it off your hands. We will do anything apart from creative work. So we will raise cases, we'll get reimbursements. We will unsuppress listings for you. We will push updates through. We'll basically take anything, any conversation and accelerate it and just take it off your hands so that you have an absolute expert doing the stuff inside Amazon Seller Central for you rather than having to do it yourself. So, you know, the aim is that our, you just give our staff the outcome and they will communicate with you, but they'll just get it done. You don't need to explain it. It's not like having a VA. You just get the result that you want to get to with a team of super smart people. And as I said before, Mike's Mike's got us as well. I, I'm like everybody's customer here, man. <laughs> I, well, I'm I mean, I, customer too. Oh, you are too. Great. Yeah. I didn't know that. So it's it's really great, John. Yeah, you always give good info. Uh, Rose, you want to try again? I have been in the e-commerce business circle in the past five years, from Amazon to um, Shopify store business, and building different kinds of brands with my business partner. And also, I'm a facilitator for a cross-border business. Awesome. Yeah, yes. Rose has been in our community for many, many years, helping a lot with the, you know, helping a lot with our the foreigners coming to China, you know, and, and really bridging Chinese events and Chinese sellers with the foreign community too. So really, thank you, Rose. It's great to have you with us on the panel. Andy Lee, Andy, you still with us? Andy, he's in our quarantine in Taiwan. You want to give us a little intro again? Hi, my name is uh, Andy. Um, get to see some of my good friends, like David. Hello. And uh, of course, uh, thank you so much, Mike, for inviting me for this uh, event. I'm, a, I'm actually a consultant and also a Amazon seller, eBay seller, and a Shopify seller. Um, I am also do coaching in Southeast Asia in terms of Amazon and also local platforms like Lazada, Shopee, Shopify, and etc. as well. So we are mainly focused in Southeast Asia. Um, Hong Kong and also in Taiwan. So that's why I'm actually quarantined in Taiwan now. Taiwan situation now is quite bad. As a matter of fact, after my quarantine tomorrow, I'm flying back to Singapore already. I have to cancel some of my events because uh, it's actually getting very serious in Taiwan now. You know, the hotel I'm leaving now is next to the expressway. I can hear so many ambulances every day. So many ambulances. Almost every hour there's an ambulance flying in. So, uh, doesn't look good in Taiwan now. Uh, of course, uh, I bless Taiwan and I hope that Taiwan will go through this. Uh, yeah. So that's all for me. I'm going back to Singapore tomorrow. Yeah. Wow. You get out of quarantine and then you go back to Singapore. That's crazy, man. That and then crazy. another 14 days quarantine. So uh, for the for the month of May, I spend my life in the hotel room. Unbelievable. Yeah. We can do it's it. Okay. We can... I, I, I get to enjoy myself doing a lot of things, you know, when your children doesn't disturb you. Oh man. Yeah. All right, Andy. Well, thanks again for coming on and sharing Thank with you. us. And Luciano's back again too. Luciano, you want to give us another quick intro? And then we'll get into some, I think we'll yes. get everybody. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mike, for inviting again. And I'm Luciano. I'm a, a co-founder of Be Kind Health and Beauty. It's a hair care product brand. Uh, we mostly 
I, I would not say I'm an Amazon seller. I would say like I'm a brand owner, right? <laughs> and Amazon is our main uh, sales channel for that. And uh, I'm living in Shenzhen in the last years and happy to help. And with any questions you guys may have, uh, pleasure to be here. Okay, sure. Let's let's move right into questions. I'm going to paste in the chat as well in case there's connection issues. You know, I think we've kind of already gotten it from the intro, some of the intros, but you know, like I just said, I'm I'm starting to work with the acquisitions company again. A lot of people here are working with acquisitions companies uh, like it's a huge trend now. So, what is what is that, you know, what is what if what does that mean to you? What have you noticed? Maybe um <laughs> I don't know, Ken. You've been you you kind of even working with acquisitions companies as your client, right? Like, there's that many acquisitions sure. companies now that you have like a whole service to help acquisitions companies. Yeah, indeed. And and just for a little context for folks that haven't kind of gone back in history, rollups have been around for quite a long time. There actually have been many famous ones that we actually know by name but haven't realized they're actually just acquisition companies that buy up fragmented businesses essentially so if you think about blockbuster back in the 99 99 2000s period right if you remember you could rent a video set you know there's just you know th those those are companies that are trying to get economies of scale and what better industry to get economies of scale than a highly fragmented business such as these e-retail e e e and commerce right so yeah, I mean, I think I think the short of it is that there's a tremendous opportunity to get economies of scale, and it's a race to get as much capital as possible and to buy as many sort of long tail companies, right? And so if you guys remember, there was a guy, a Harvard professor named Chris Anderson, who wrote a book called The Long Tail back in 2004. And the idea is that there's many, many categories of, of niches, and the internet just kind of expanded that pie tremendously. Huge access to customers, and you can advertise and then reach customers in many, many different ways. And so what there's what the acquirers are seeing is that there's just there's just a no, there's opportunities to sort of uh, dominate certain niches. If you think about the slivers along a curve, right, a curve kind of go like this, right. So a fat curve, part of the curve, and a long part of the curve. If you just dominate one or two of those slivers and start looking at adjacencies, that becomes a tremendous opportunity to get continuous cash flows. So from an FBI acquirer perspective, it's just, you know, kind of a no brainer. The question is, since there's so much cash out there, so much capital, who can actually uh, acquire the fastest and acquire and into the most and dominate the most niches. So that's at least kind of the, the, the top level view in my perspective. I don't know if that helps. Awesome. That, that helps. That helps me for sure. Yeah, because there's definitely a lot of money going into the space, right? I mean, if you look at the charts, there's investors pumping money into all these different funds. and. Uh, I think the real war, the real, the real, like you said, finding the acquisitions, getting the deal flow seems to be the uh, the real secret sauce or the the real the real way to to make it succeed. Uh, David, do you have some insights? You've been working with some acquisitions companies and in the space for a long time in Amazon. What what would you say you've been seeing? Yeah, as Ken was saying, I mean, yeah, we all agree there is a lot of money being invested, you know, coming into this into this kind of business right now. Uh, you know, Tracio, more than a billion US dollar. I, I, I believe right now 1.7. Uh, they're going on IPO. I learned that just a few days ago. I'm not sure when the date of the IPO is going to be, but it's going to be the first of this kind of company to, to go public. And this is really opening our eyes. And also Tracio was the fastest company to reach the unicorn status in the in the history of the United States companies that that's what I believe that's what I heard and this is this is incredible you know and it's showing us how you know the e-commerce business is just booming I think after the ignition that was given by the COVID-19 crisis now we are just unleashing the potential and I remember how right after COVID-19 hit, all the Amazon sellers were, you know, unstable and now it's just growing. It was actually a kind of way to weed out the uh, weak sellers, let's say, or those that weren't performing too well or that had some problems. And now it's kind of consolidating. So it's, it's even bigger and better. There is more money. There is more people actually buying online. From my side, I can tell you that the culture of buying online is changing because we always focus in the US and in China where e-commerce is pretty much present in everyday's life of the people. 
But I can tell you, me being Italian, coming from Europe, not all people are used to buy things all online. There was no Amazon agencies. Uh, there were, we, we had no competition because we have also now a branch in Italy and we had no competition. We weren't even promoting that so, so much until a year ago. And now, you know, a, a lot of Amazon consultants came in Italy. A lot of companies are trying to reach out to see whether they whether it is actually good for them to invest on Amazon. And some of them, they still don't understand the potential. They see Amazon as the bad, the evil, you know, they don't know what Amazon, what e-commerce is. And so we are evolving, we are changing for sure. We're not at the level of China and uh, Asian countries. For example, I was interviewing Andy directly. And for example, live selling has been a thing as we know, because, you know, we have all been in China somehow for a few years in China and also in Southeast Asia. Now it's been coming in um, on Amazon since the end of last year and it's wow, the big thing. So everyone now is talking about Amazon Live or TikTok influencers. We've been, in my agency, we've made so much content about this, but it's been in China and in Southeast Asia for so long. Also people live selling on Facebook without having a store. So this is this is incredible. And you know, this acquiring Amazon FBA business, I think I think this is the natural evolution of where the e-commerce is going, just getting things more and more serious. So we see the the actually enterprises, the companies, the big whales now putting their effort and money into this into this flow and we see this kind of i can i can say that first first person because i'm working for some acquisition companies that there is a war right now in actually hiring the best talents out there that might be in the us in china to help them scale their business to help them get the sellers that they want to onboard the, the right people and to develop the business better and better maybe Andy, you want to add something to this well, as a matter of fact, um, I just received a WeChat message uh, just about a few hours ago. My account, my account manager from uh, China, is actually going to TikTok. Okay, so he's going Amazon going to TikTok now, and uh, he, he told me that there's a lot of people going through the trend now, going out of Amazon to the other, um, you know, social media platforms. So what happened is what David has said is totally uh, true, and we see a lot of people doing live selling and everything in Southeast Asia. It's really, really crazy. And their sales can be much, even much higher than compared to their sales in their online store or even their offline store. But the main issue or main thing that I believe is going to be the trend, number one trend that's going forward is that this coming last quarter, whether is it Amazon, is it eBay, whichever e-commerce platform, the person who is going to make the most sales and make the most money is not whether you go in your marketing, but it's whether are you good in your logistics. The logistic will be the key to whether you're going to make money this coming last quarter. So good luck to everyone. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate these insights. Yeah, I mean, we were ahead of the curve, right? But now it's it's getting, there's getting to be a lot of people in, in this space. But I liked what, it, what David said, too. It's like weeded out. I got scared, honestly. I think a lot of us got scared right when COVID hit and uh, warehouses were closed and everything. And it, it, it did change a lot, but... Rose, what are you noticing in the space? You know, you're you're in Shenzhen. You you go to a lot of seller events in China. Like, what what kind of things are you noticing in the in the industry? Well, I think most of us know about, heard about the event happened in May 10th. Amazon suspended multiple Chinese sellers with revenue over one billion. Right? Yeah. So that's a big it was crazy. like exploding news in the in the circle. So I think what that would change in the M and A business is. A lot more company be, will be a lot more careful when they do the due diligence while acquiring, um, especially Chinese sellers. So right now I see the trend that people or some company they are going into um, acquiring like small comp small Amazon companies that with uh, about hundred thousand or twenty thousand in revenue a month a year. Sorry, which means new company that's only six months or one month old with highly great potential. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for that. Be... Rose. I'll keep going. Sorry if you had more. I didn't mean to stop. I'm just saying this sudden event happened early this month would affect the way foreign capitals acquire Chinese Amazon business, you know, in terms of due diligence. Because as we all know, a lot of Chinese sellers, many of them, when they started the company, started the business. 
a lot of black hat, white hat skills. So that's like a potential bomb. Yeah. I I mean, guys, I was, I've been working with Amazon seller since 2014 and I can relate. I started working with one of the, at that time it was top five Amazon seller in the world. So it was one of the top sellers from China and also one of the top global sellers, Sambali Tech. And uh, in t- 2014, I mean, we still had the opportunity to do in- in- incentivized reviews. And uh, I remember there was a time of Anchor, you know, com- competing with some Valley Tech, with, with Aoki. And then I started working directly with Aoki as an external consultant in 2016, actually, even before launching my agency. And I remember, I mean, we all know Aoki was suspended. I don't know if they're already back on or not. Maybe you guys can tell me. But this kind of thing has been going on for a while. So we, we all know that. And I, I definitely think that what Rose said is really important because China is very, very appealing as a marketplace to go and shop Amazon FBA businesses. So all these kind of companies that want to acquire Amazon FBA businesses like Trasio, like all the others, they invest a big part of their budget into China. And the due diligence, as Rose was saying, is something really, really important. And now that this thing once again happened, now everyone is scared as as they should be, because of course it's like reminding us, okay, take a look at what is going on here. We, we all know something, what is going on. I've been personally talking about Black Hat for so long. I was speaking also at, uh, you know, at the Global From Asia Cross Border Summit, at the Global Sources Summit for, you know, for Amazon sellers regarding Black Hat more than once. We wrote and we interviewed a lot of people about this thing. So it is a thing. And I think, you know, the businesses, they really want to be careful, but still it doesn't stop them. And I, I heard actually that, I mean, I know as a matter of fact that until a couple of months ago, no one was able to directly acquire a business in China. And I think that Probably the due diligence was also one of the most important factors that was delaying this this acquisition process. And I know that it already happened by at least two or three of the companies that are, you know, doing this, this kind of business right now. So it is very, very important. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. I think another question for sellers is when do they decide to sell, you know, to sell out to these acquisitions companies or should they grow? You know, should they keep building um what are some thought processes you know there's all these companies like even they can talk to me now i'll I'll buy their business (laughs) david you know can i'm sure there's others in this event that would love to buy some sellers how does a seller decide should they sell or should they grow or or change me or john (laughs) uh Whoever, I think both would, I'd love to hear both your insights, but whoever goes well, first, like, Luciano, you want to I, I, I really like the, this question because I personally want, I want to hear more insights from, from the other peers about that, especially Davide, because I, I'm a shareholder of an Amazon company and as... As Rose said previously, recently a lot of uh, Chinese companies, Amazon accounts were shut down, right? And now we have this, this situation where, where the market is trying to understand, is it safe to invest in an Amazon business or not? And I think in a moment like that might not be the best moment from my perspective to to sell your business right because you you still need to understand uh, what's going on with the market and as an amazon seller you're you're very you rely a lot on on amazon as a as a marketplace as a sales channel because amazon for for a seller they can decide uh, they can decide anything overnight so so this is this these are my two cents but i really would like to to hear more from yeah, I mean, John, John as you, well, because I'm also very interested in the topic. And you've sold your, you've sold a, you've sold a business before, I believe, right? Or and you've worked with sellers that have sold. There's been a lot, a lot of activity, and you work with a lot of sellers, seller candy. What would you, you know, what do you notice? You know, what do you hear at the, at the bars, drinking, t- drinking? What do you hear? <laughs> drinking chatter. Yeah. So yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because as sellers, I look a lot at, at businesses for sale and I think, you know, this guy's milked it for all he's worth. Who's going to buy this business? I'm sure you guys also see that when you look at uh, broker sites and you're like, wow, this, this business seems to be pretty much optimized. And then, then aggregator comes out and buys it. 
And the realization that I had is that I was talking to my friends about this and they're like, yeah, the market's so hot that people have money are just looking for any way of getting return. And that's, you know, a sign that the market's super overheated. And, you know, FBA businesses, even if they stay stable, have incredible returns. You know, if you get it for 4X, you get 25% a year return. And if you're an aggregator, you're not going to get 4X when you flip your aggregator or if you go public. You know, Thrasio is going to get, what, an insane return, 100X return probably on profit. So they don't care. As long as you're not, it's not going to collapse and that your business is growing, they just seem to be, you know, they're just aggregating, they're raising money, the founders are going to make money. I don't know if, the, I personally don't know if the company is ever going to uh, turn out to be some crazy unicorn because it's just an Amazon business, isn't it? But I think it's really interesting and I'm super interested to see where it goes. How about Ken? What do you think? Overheated? You know, is it multiples? You know, what, what are your thoughts? You, you work with a lot of acquisitions companies and help them out. Yeah, and, and I, I guess if you look at it from an acquirer standpoint, essentially they're looking for steady cash, cash flows, a solid EBITDA, and some trajectory, right? Some trajectory. And maybe maybe it's not, you know, 5 10% year over year or quarter over quarter. It's something like 5 uh, you know, 1% or 2%, but it's steady. And for them, as I think it was John that said, these, these roll-ups aren't, you know, the, at the end of the day, the, the, if you think about it like stacking blocks, right? When you stack a block and you've got a, a cash flow stream and you just keep acquiring and lay, layering more and more sellers on top of it, at some point you reach sort of this critical mass, right? And that's what Thrasio is going through right now. That's why they're able to go uh, to the public markets potentially uh, and get in your, you know, over $1 billion valuation. So I, I would say um, overheating might be kind of a strong term at the moment, mainly because the the market size is so so big and it's expanding. I mean, think about the tectonic shift that we just went through after COVID. Consumer behaviors globally, not just in the US and North America and, and, and Asia, and then in the other developing markets also, the behavior shift to e-commerce, buying things online, the comfort level has shifted tremendously. And that may be indelible, that may not change dramatically after we go back to some level of normalcy. So for them, they may, they may feel like they're getting ahead of the curve. They're also acquiring economies of scale, really growing and trying to dominate certain niches or, or you know, categories. And then maybe the end game is may, you may not, it may not just be simply an IPO and maybe they spin it off, they go private. There's a lot of things we have steady cash flow from an investment banking yeah. or finance perspective to uh, right. take advantage of, right? Yeah. It's great, Ken. Uh, a little bit of my my insights in the space too is, if you look at the bigger is higher multiples. <clears throat> so if you buy a lot of smaller sellers, you usually pay a, a lower premium. And then if you become bigger, you're safer investment to an investor, so you can charge a higher premium. So you're making you're making that spread as an acquisitions company. So you're buying four to five times yearly earnings. <clears throat> I think that's the going rate right now. Three, two, three, two is low, three, four, five. But they're 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 raising money at much higher multiples. And they're hoping to IPO at a even like I don't know, Thrashy was probably like what 30, 30 or something like that. And so I think that's the whole game, right? So the small sellers rolling them up, you become a bigger seller you get cheaper access to capital, you get cheaper rates on shipping, like John is talking here. I hope I say your name correctly. Bigger is kind of better in a way, you know, smaller smaller is getting harder. I don't like to be a hater. You know, I, I love startups and entrepreneurs, but it's getting, I think, uh, harder. Like earlier in the panels, panel one, logistics costs, you know, you know, all this, all these challenges makes it harder for, for everybody, but it makes it more costly for the smaller people. Yeah. So that's that's the game, right? That's that's the game. So you know, unfortunately, I think consolidation is going to continue to to happen in the space for these reasons. I haven't heard much from Christina. I guess maybe she's a little bit more into China. But Christina, do you have any insights you'd like to just? Hi. You're you you studied overseas. You you came back yeah. to China. You work with e-commerce both ways. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insights that you've? You've seen, if you'd like yeah, to give some insights. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Because I have been on both sides of the business, so I see the difference. But 
I see Amazon becoming like marketplace that's focusing on the branding very much, and especially for the acquisition companies. And some of the companies that I contact with, they are actually interested in buying the business that are more, I mean, developing into brands. So they might not just um, buying like the whole business. They they invest a little bit on the on some part of the business, or or they just more like a incubation tool to help the the sellers to becoming a brand, and it's more similar to what what like the business in the let's say in the Timor Global, because uh, some of the uh, investor, the venture companies that I contact with, they are interested in, let's say, getting the sellers from overseas into the China markets and helping them to develop develop into brands. So I, I believe that in the future, Amazon will also, I mean, the sellers in uh, Amazon will go into the same way as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that insight, Christina. And how's how's uh, how are we doing on time? Or uh, Rose, you have I saw you say something. Rose, you have something to say? I'd love to hear. Uh, more. Yes, on the acquisition business and a lot of big companies that are entering this market, I think they are buying and also establishing their own account. And you know, these two uh, two types of uh, two different ways to operate the business. I mean, they in parallel. For example, they will buy business, and that's a hundred. Uh, one million, one million turnover, and at the same time, they would also either build something on you know, uh, launching your product uh, and buying buy the small account to build a business to grow the business. I'm not sure if <laughs> do you get what I mean. I I mean companies that are buying the business, they also launch product on their own. They buy business and also grow the business on their own, launch new products. In the same brand, in that current brand. In, if you talk about the portfolio of the business, part of the portfolio is to, to acquire a business, and on the other side, they also have a team to launch product on their own, so that mm. they don't have to buy everything. Yeah, so it, I think yeah, it goes back to the scaling to really scale your business. You have a team, so you're adding another portfolio, another brand, another yes. group of ASINs, and then you could launch. Because it's true, like sometimes a current that current seller doesn't have that team to launch new products or the capital to launch new products, so they could buy that company, and then uh, getting some. There's some jokes coming in, and the <laughs> Ken's making me laugh here. But yeah, I agree. Like once you, I think that that's what I try to say in our our company. You know, I'm really happy with Camille stepping up here and Jan and our community. Once you have a good team, right? You can really scale. So if you're scaling and growing, you could acquire others, launch products on that brand with your current team. You're not adding more cost, right? You're just growing the growing products and then using your core team to scale. I think that's what you. That's how I would say what you've mentioned, right, Rose? Oh yes, correct. Correct. Awesome. Because when when company acquire business, they still have to have. A good operation team to handle all the business at the same time to launch business in terms of cost saving. I want to add something here. This is actually yeah. the, the the business model that has been working very very well for uh, a lot of big Chinese brands. If you guys uh, you know pay attention to this to the history, for example, of Sun Valley and LK and uh, even big brands like Anchor. And let's let's do the example of LK, for example, because we mentioned them before they were suspended, but they did, I mean, no one can say differently. They did huge business on Amazon. They are a multi-million dollar company, a billion dollar company probably. I still have friends who work in LK. They, they raised something like 100 different brands. Now I don't know the exact number, but when I was working for them, for them as consultants, so I was going to their office pretty much every other day, and that was in 2017, they had around 20 to 30 brands. And then until last year, they, they kept growing the brand. So this was actual even before companies like Tricio came to this business. So we see that actually consolidating and putting a lot of different brands into the same basket, into a, this main company concept actually works because you use the logistics together, 
you kind of use similar marketing strategies. You you count on the, you know, we were saying before that the logistic is very important right now. If you win on the logistics, you're pretty much win on Amazon. And this is this is right, you know, also because a lot of other 3PL service providers and companies that offer service to help you do FBM better because FBA is much harder to do right now. This is really the key to your success on Amazon because you could do the best marketing in the world, but if you cannot ship as many products as you want to sell, you're done. So you need to have a you know a different kind of fulfillment center, a fulfillment strategy. So this has been the strategy of brand of companies like Alk, and they were developing brands in many different categories. They they had, for example, iCock in the kitchen, and they had Alk with power banks. They had Nipo with electronic massagers that I was personally following, and and now they're also jumping into the same business as Trasio. They're going to buy Amazon FBA businesses in China. And I think that probably for some kind of cultural, you know, reasons, they might be a lot successful also because they have a lot of money. So definitely, you know, the big fish takes the small fish and also creates the small fishes inside. This is a kind of strategy that actually has been working already before companies like Tracio entered the market and is actually showing to be to continuously work work in this kind of, you know, in this kind of business, in the e-commerce in general. It, it actually makes a lot of sense. Awesome. All right. Thank you for yes. sharing your insights, Thank you. David. Yeah, we, we can continue the the sharing of insights during the roundtables, which we are about to switch to. All right. So there was our panel three. This is a third and final panel or uh, from the May 2021 first ever, like you said, online cross border matchmaker CBM. Also, everybody, save the date, Jan. Do we? I'm afraid to say the exact dates, but I think do we have dates for the next one? Yeah, I think we have agreed on September um, 17, but we're but this time we are doing it twice during September 17. So that's going to be six, seven a.m. to eleven a.m. and six p.m. to ten p.m. I think, but that could change. You know, <laughs> you know yeah. how things are right now. We are constantly changing things. Yeah, we're but always... I hope this is going to be the final, Mike. <laughs> I think so. You know, one of the feedbacks we collected was it wasn't, we, you know, I guess it's one of the advantages. We have people really all around the world in the community. So time zone is tough. So some will be maybe not the best time for, for some people in certain parts of the world, but some will be. So we thought we would split it to maybe U.S. and Asia time and like Europe, Asia time friendly of course people can stay up at any time in the night or the day and come to both but we thought that might be a good test for this second online cbm and uh, right Th this way we're going to cover the three major time zones the asia the americas and europe so i if you guys think otherwise of course you can let us know and we can adjust the time as early as now so that we don't keep changing the, <laughs> the specifics of the CBM. But I think this one will do, Mike, right? I think it'll work. I mean, also thinking to leave the room open even between the sessions. I think we use AirMeet and we could let the rooms be open for networking even in between the two sessions. We've noticed that we've, we've done this with other other projects where we left it open and people kind of just could hop in and make a, maybe a, their booth or their tables because it has a networking. So maybe we'll just leave it open and then people could, maybe even we could do some special surprise pop-up uh, session inside in the middle maybe. But we'll, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, me, Jan and us, we, well, we try to listen, you know, we could just stay the same, but I think we keep on improve, trying to improve and listen. So let's we'll see how this one goes. And then I think I said at the beginning, I'll share even with you, Jan, and others about what's been happening. I've been, yeah, I think you've said, you've noticed it, Jan. You're like, Mike, you're so busy late, more busy than I'm always busy, but you're like, you're so much busier. So I thought I could share some of the things I've been doing and learning about in the Amazon acquisition space. What do you think? Yeah, I would like to hear more about that. I think that's a very hot topic right now. Know. You know, there's businesses that they keep buying, they keep buying um, Amazon sellers. So any great insights from you, Mike, I think might greatly impact our listeners. So yeah. you want to share your yeah, I mean, thoughts? I, I picked up some insights at the panel that 
there too. And, you know, I think people got some insights already from that, but I, I just maybe even since the panel happened, I've been even deeper into this. Like I said at the beginning, there's globalformation.com slash broker. So we're having sellers in our community, our network, our membership talking to us, asking and I, you know, I'm a, that's what we do. We know people, right? Here, so many years, School of Asia and myself personally, we know people in this space. So the Chinese sellers are a little bit new to this. I mean, I think my biggest feedback is Chinese sellers never plan to sell their business, whereas Western or foreign or international sellers I guess the word is digital nomad. Do you know that word, Jen? Have you heard of the digital nomad before? Yeah, I heard. I heard. <laughs> digital nomads are, you know, they're traveling online business people. A lot of our, I think our community would maybe fall under that. Although right now with COVID lockdown, there's not much traveling. But so these kind of sellers are more easy to sell their business, or at least it's not, they're a little bit more flexible. Whereas Chinese sellers, they are not like building this to sell it and do another one. They are more like doing this as a long term. And I think their main exit is called an exit strategy. An exit strategy is like, what do you, what's your end goal with the business? So uh, exit strategy could be a lifelong like business. Like actually what I think we're trying to do here is hopefully a life sounds scary, but could be just for long-term cash flow for, you know, for the team and for the owners and, and, and et cetera. The others could be like a flip, you know, a flip is where it's like, I build it and I, or I buy it, I fix it. I sell it for more. Like even with houses, people talk about that, you know, you buy a house, you fix it, you sell it. And then some people want to go all the way to like IPO, like initial public offering, which means going on a stock exchange and, uh, and individual investors buying like shares of your company. And if you can believe it, Jan, a lot of Chinese sellers are going for IPO, you know, or of course, like, or a huge, a huge exit, a huge acquisition when they're really, really big. So a, a lot of these sellers in China are not used to someone wanting to buy their, their business. So it's one big thing is we have to educate them. Why, why, why sell or why does somebody even want to buy this? And one of the tricky things is they can't, they're not, if they do sell, they can't, they can't do it again. Not, they can't, if I'm going to sell these, this just fell off. Like if I sell these on, on Amazon, this globe, and then I sell this to an investor or another company, I can't start another brand and say, this is, you know, before it was Mike's globes. Now it's jansglobes.com or whatever. So you have to sign a non-compete. So I think the one thing is they have to really not compete if they sell. So we're just trying to educate them about, about this. And it's, you know, the other thing is, I don't know if I said it on the podcast or even to you, but I've been trying to get back to Shenzhen. I'm in Shenyang. We'll start with an S, but they're a few hours from each other. You know, I think you can imagine business anywhere, but especially China business is a lot of face-to-face. -face. You know, you can imagine, especially buying somebody's company. So I'm trying to get there so that I could do some smaller events, you know, for our community and, and introductions, maybe some dinners, some, some workshops to, to, to educate them. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot more education. And the other one is they just, to get the valuation of your business, usually you have to give more information, but I don't think it's just Chinese sellers. I think any seller is like, well, how much, how much are you going to give me if I sell? And they're like, we have to say, well, you got to give us your financials, your product detail. Obviously, you have to trust us a lot, right? Uh, they have to tell you a lot. Not a lot, but at least some basic information like the products, the sales. So we've been noticing like they have to trust us and they have to sign like NDA. So some of my experiences is, of course, they, they need to trust. I mean, of course, even I, I'm somewhat, you know, build a brand even in China. We have a WeChat account. And, but of course, they're, they're somewhat hesitant or slower to like sign an NDA and send in like their sales and their product deet inform you know, listings and stuff. So, but we are getting close on some deals, you know, these don't happen. Obviously it doesn't happen like right away. We've only been doing this like a couple, couple of months and, and with, at least for me. So, you know, hopefully we'll convert some in the next, next month or two, but some have gotten past the contract, have been sending in their information, gone through due diligence. And my last part, 
that I'll add is I kind of want them to publicly say that they sold so we could use that as a testimonial or as a case study, right, Jan? Like the, a lot of times to get other people, you show whether it's a service company or a product company or a acquisition, you want to show your cases, right? But I think, I think who really, not, not even just Chinese, but especially people don't want to be so public that they got million dollars to sell their company, right? And put their face on the internet. <laughs> you know? So I don't know if Chinese sellers are going to be willing to say that they sold publicly, you know, because they kind of want to, especially the Chinese sellers are more secretive, but I think all sellers are a little bit secretive about what they do, what their product is. So that's just some stuff I've been learning, but hopefully, hopefully we got a couple of big sellers and that's one of the advantages we have at GFA. Like one of them was at our events in 2016 at Cross Border Summit. All right. And he heard we're doing this and he approached us, of course, in WeChat. And then he's provided us a lot of the financials. And in the course, it's a pretty established Chinese seller. So, but again, it's not fast and it's a high, you know, it's a high, high volume business. So it's, it'll be a big one, but I have a feeling we might get it. It seems like it's going to the next stage. So that's some updates. Yeah, that's great, Mike, to hear about the progress of this project that we have. But if someone wants to contact us, would you... Would you mind get, giving them the email address they can email so that we can assist them? Sure. I mean, I'm trying, like I said before the recording, well, let's, let's see if they, Jen, Jen, you're, you're so, you're really super um, uh, smart and, you know, you're, you're learning about the community. I think we want to get you more involved anyway. So I think we'll go to our group email box, blog at globalfromasia.com. But I think Jen, you could help take that case or there's actually a long form but they probably don't want to, it seems like they don't want to fill out the form right away. Probably they want to talk to us. So I think they could reach out probably by email or, or of course, if they're on WeChat, to talk to us, talk to you. I think, you know, that would probably be a first step and then learn a little bit about what they're doing. Actually, if they look at globalformation.com slash broker, we put the kind of criteria we're looking for, the different uh, target sales and, and industries and markets and things like that. So they can also understand more, but, but yeah, I think talk to Jan. Jan's great, right? Yeah, thank you, Mike. I always, pretty much everything about the emails that are coming to us, I usually reply to them. So, oh. yeah. Okay. Awesome. I think that's it for today. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Yes. Again for help, helping out. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me again. To get more info about running an international business, please visit our website at www.globalfromasia.com. That's www.globalfromasia.com. Also, be sure to subscribe to our iTunes feed. Thanks for tuning in.